All right, welcome everyone. Let's give the Lord a hand. I'm going to start off by sharing some some little testimony with uh, me and my mom. We go way back. So I don't know how your guys' uh, relationship is with your parents, but with my mom and my dad. Well, my mom, she was actually a pretty good parent. She was very caring. She was, uh, I used to tell my wife, she was the block parent. So I don't know if you ever heard of that, but years ago when somebody was in a neighborhood for a long time, they would, I don't know who would appoint you, but they would put like a little sign in your door, and it'd say block parent. So somebody had trouble, I guess they'd come to your house. But we had, the, we're the house that all the kids went to. So it was kind of fun. We kind of, we still like that, right? So the thing about my mom, she was very controlling. You know, growing up, we had a big family. Uh, Grandma had 13 kids. So back then, I don't think there was much TV, no Netflix. So uh, people were just watching, doing whatever, right? So um, we had, there was 13 kids, so there was always, like, um, activities. We would be at home. We would be uh, doing things all the time. My mom was just, she knew how to run a house. And um, even though my dad was kind of like the, the macho male, he just was really silent. He really wasn't around much. So she would run our house, you know, during holidays especially. We live right down the street from my grandma. It was literally four houses down. So we'd be going back and forth. So she, would, she was really good at organizing things. When there was Christmas, any kind of holiday, everything went through my mom. And a lot of my aunts and uncles would call her and say, hey, um, what are we doing? What's the time? All that stuff. So even like growing up, too, like in Saturday morning when we'd grow up, we'd get up in the morning. We could not. We were not those kids that would get up at 10, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. It wasn't possible. We'd get like a little nudge about 7, and she would say, rise and shine, and she'd like be singing a little song to us. And um, we thought that was cool. Um, even though it was kind of irritating at the time, we appreciate it, especially now. But uh, we had to get up. Saturdays, we always had chores. When we got home from school, there was always something to do. You were never left to yourself. So I don't, like I said, I don't know how your guys' house was, but ours was, we were always doing something. I think about my mom's house, it was spotless, especially on weekends. She'd get up, she would play her uh, albums, you know, her vinyl albums. Most of those, the youth don't know what those are. But um, they would, she would play music and she would just, uh, clean all day, and she would give us things to do. So we had everything to do from vacuuming, dusting. We would um, we would be hanging clothes, washing them, folding them with the little clothespins. That's why, if you guys remember that story with the clothespins and the bees, we'd get bored and go and get the bees with the clothespin. So we would be very busy. Uh, she always had us going, and then when we were done, we couldn't just stay in the house. We had to go out play all day. So we would just take some snacks, fill our pockets with food, and go. We would just come back, go like at 9 a.m. and come back like at, I don't know, 4 or 5 o'clock when it was time to eat. And uh, we just did that all the time growing up. There was always kids and cousins around. So that was kind of nice, but still, um, everything went through my mom. Uh, One of the cool things I remember about my mom uh, she loved Disneyland. Our our kids know this. So every single year, twice a year, we'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, like on a Friday or Saturday, and we would just have everything packed. She was very organized. She would pack everything. Uh, we had snacks. We had clothes. We had everything, and we would just get up and drive to L.A. to Disneyland, and we would open the park. So we would be there, and back then, you know, you know, you couldn't buy things online. You had to just go and stand in line. And, but we were always, we would always be the first car there. I don't know if you guys remember, like, the Griswolds. When you get there and he has a whole parking lot, that was us. We didn't need the tram. We were, like, so close. We would be. So, anyway, um, we would just go there. and We would just, you know, I, I look at some of the things that she did. And even though she was really controlling, she had some really good things about her. And um, she was really organized. So, for example, we would open the park. Stay there all day till like two. Everybody was tired. We'd come back to the hotel, eat, swim, just kind of take naps. And the funny thing is, I still do that. I, I still take naps around that two o'clock, so I got used to that. But then you'd get up, get ready, and then go and close the park at midnight. 
So it was kind of cool. Uh, they didn't have fast passes at that time. And at the time, they had this thing called e-tickets. So it was just a little paper ticket you would buy, and you would have to go and give it to the boots out there. But now you have the little um, band for the fast pass. So that's kind of cool. So like I said, my mom was very organized. She knew she always had something to do. People always would call her and ask her. So whether it be first thing in the morning or sometimes we'd get called at midnight or people come knocking on the door because they needed some help from my mom. But this is the thing with my mom. So even though she was organized, she was cold, there was something about her that you didn't cross her. You, if you didn't comply you knew you were going to be in trouble. But that was the thing. One of her downfalls was that she was always on the go. She did not know when to stop. And later in life, it ended up catching up to her. So especially like um, just an example of that, like during uh, Christmas, I tell my wife now, but we would get up like during Christmas time, and her and my aunt, which is her closest sister, we'd get up, and we would go to the mall, and it was when the malls were, like, full, like, all the stores. And you would just go to every single store, come home with, like, eight bags. And as kids, we were just exhausted. We'd be sleeping under the little partitions there. And, and then uh, later on, she would, um, you know, she would treat us to go get us some McDonald's or something. So that was our pay. But, um, but still... Um, Again, she was just always on the go. She just, she really didn't like to stop. And um, even growing up, as we got older, moving fast forward, we started butting heads a lot because I was kind of like her. I was kind of controlling too. I learned it from the best. So, you know, when she would um, have these ideas, when I got older, I, I had my own ideas. You know, you're 14, 15 years old, and you think you know everything, right? So we would butt heads a lot, and Um, But I always knew that she was the boss. So recently this got me thinking. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about and praying about something in particular. And um, sometimes when you pray, you know, of course, you're doing your praying and all that. And in the prayer, I heard, I felt, I, I heard the word control. And I wasn't thinking about my mom at the time. I was just about control. Like, what does that mean? So just the way my mind works, out of curiosity, I go and look it up, I Googled it. So the word control actually has two meanings. So one of them is this, one who has influence over their environment. So that was clearly my mom. So growing up um, and even uh, taking psychology class, they say that the human mind wants to control their environment. That's my mom. But there was a second one, which I didn't really know too much about this, but it's more of an area of self-control. It's more of a balanced, sound mind. And this is the thing that kind of surprised me. It, it says in the, in the uh, Greek commentary, if you guys look it up, it says uh, control is to recall one to his senses. And that surprised me because I was thinking, like, how does that control? But anyway, moving forward, I looked at, I realized there's a couple of different levels of control. Just like there are different in the English language there's two different meanings of words, like the word here and here, right? Uh, there and like there. There's uh, bear as in the animal bear and bear like as in naked. So it's the same thing. So, they, you know, the English language has a lot of different meanings, and I thought that was kind of cool. But as I started meditating more about this, um, I started thinking about the different levels of control. So this is the title of my sermon. At some point, we need to come to our senses. That's the other control. So years ago, when Joshua was a baby, before we came here, it was years ago, and we lived here in the Bay Area, and my wife and I were just having a lot of trouble, right? So we actually split up for a few months. And... um, as she was living in Fresno, I was here in the Bay Area, and we were trying to figure things out. We didn't know anything. We were young, and uh, we had a little little baby. And I decided, because things were not going the way I wanted it to go, and I wasn't happy, I decided I wanted to go to a Christian counselor. So I, I met this guy, 
So I go down there, and he basically, he just came out and told me, he said, the reason why your life is out of control, because you're too controlling, right? So he says people who are over controlling, they're trying to compensate for their lack. And um, of course, me and our, even our relationship, there was just a lot of lack. We didn't, we didn't have God at the time. So we were trying to figure things out on our own. So we we're trying to control, I was trying to control the environment. And um, again, as I was thinking about how my mom was, that's what she did. She controlled everybody, all the family. There was a lot of people, strong personalities, and she just, she had everybody in line, right? But the, the problem was she did all this in the flesh. She also didn't know the Lord. When we moved here 2013, or actually 14, from Fresno, um, after we moved here a week later, my mom got sick. So she was in and out of the hospital for a year. Once we moved and we found out she was getting sick, thank God we're here because then we can spend a little time with her. But she had everything wrong. She had cancer, diabetes. She had arthritis, high blood pressure, everything. And she was on so many medications. So um, even at that time when I would, um, when we started coming here, of course you're all excited and you're, we're at Osgood and we were all on fire. So we're trying to like, tell her about the Lord, but she wasn't having it. She just wasn't ready. And as I spoke with her about it, it just wasn't her time. She didn't have the ability. So we just kind of let her be. And as we got more and more involved, every time we kind of laugh about this now, but um, every time they would ask us, what are you guys doing this weekend? Oh, we're in church again? It's like, because we were always in church. And, but she didn't understand that because she wanted to control our lives. Even uh, my wife recently told me, and I don't remember her saying this, but she said that she pulled her aside when we first met. And see, you got to think about this. When you first meet, you're like putting your best foot forward. And my mom says, she says, you know, Ellen, I don't like anybody coming between me and my kids. And she just kind of stared her down. And I'm thinking like, oh, how did you even last here? I would have probably been gone, right? I would have been, go get somebody else. But the problem is when my mom got sick, she, um, she didn't know what to do. She was really scared. And, and, and toward the end, when somebody has diabetes, it starts, you start losing feeling in your legs, right, in your limbs. So we were spending time with her. She was going in and out of the doctors. And um, the problem is she tried to do everything on her own. So even when our family had the, the meeting at the doctor, uh, we all met. There was a bunch of us. Everybody was saying, don't worry, Mary, that's her name. Um, we're going to fight this. Don't worry. We're going we're gonna to get through this. And, and we're over here thinking, like, like, wow. Like, we're thinking about God and, like, what, what should we do? Should we pray about it? And the family's over there trying to, like, do the same thing she was. They were trying to handle it on their own. But anyways, long story short, um, my mom got so sick, she started losing her limbs. We went and prayed for her, and she was supposed to be at the hospital, and they were going to, I've said this before at a different um, sermon, but she lost part of her leg. So it gets like, there's no circulation, right? So on this next one, she was supposed to lose another part of her second leg, and she was devastated. So, um, you know, some of the uh, chaplains, they come in, and they let you, they let the people come and talk to her. But the doctor that was supposed to do the surgery he got pulled away. He never showed up. So it was just me and my sister there. We're at Kaiser and San Leandro. So I remember asking pastor, like, what do I do? What do I tell her? And he said, well, let her know that she tried to do everything her own way. And she seen what that, you seen what that got her. But now have her try God. So we did. So we went over there and we just talked to her, uh, my sister and I. My sister's Catholic, so she didn't really know what to do. But anyways, we started praying for her. And um, anyway, she ended up giving her heart to the Lord, right? So we didn't know if it was a genuine thing. I did tell her, don't do this for me. Don't do this for anybody else. This is you, between you and God. And you're at a point now where, you know, you did try things your own way. You controlled your whole life. Now you have an opportunity here. So if you can pull up Psalm 116. 
my wife and I were praying about it. Anyways, when my mom eventually ended up passing away, the Lord gave us the scripture. And it was really so powerful when we read it. We were in tears. We actually, uh, they asked us to put together her little, um, um, like the little, what do they call that? The program for her funeral. And uh, we put this on that program. But this is what exactly what happened to her. I love you, God, because he listened to me. Listened, listened as I begged for mercy. He listened so intently as I laid out my case before him. Death stared at me in the face. Hell was hard at my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. And that's where she was. She was really scared. My mom was not the type who was scared of anything, but she was really scared at that time. So death stared at me in the face. Hell was hard at my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. Then I called out to God for help. Please, God, I cried out. Save my life. God is gracious. It is he who makes things right, our most compassionate God. God takes the side of the helpless. When I was at the end of my rope, he saved me. And it was just a beautiful thing because when we got that, we're like, I never had read the scripture. This was the message version too, so it was pretty powerful. And um, even at the, the funeral, when people, they were just, we knew God was involved because um, even though we were still kind of new Christians from here, uh, in this church, um, we knew that God was already doing something. We just didn't completely understand it at the time. If you can pull up uh, Luke 15. So this is the story of the prodigal son. Most of you guys know this already. And it's pretty short, but um, I'm just going to read the whole thing but so you can get context of it. But um, the prodigal son actually has some hints in there that I think we can, we can learn from. And I think sometimes we read it and we just kind of bypass it. But I also went into, did a little study in the commentaries and learned a few things. And Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And I read, that's like a third like a third of his estate, and that was a lot. That was a lot of money. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And this was kind of incredible because back then or, or even now, you don't get an inheritance unless somebody dies. So he was basically saying to his dad, you're dead to me. I just want the money. I want what I want. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and squandered in the wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 17. This is the part right here. When he came to his senses, how did he come to his senses? He's like, he's lost, right? He's foolish. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up. And went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. So he was going all out for his son. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I'm going to stop there. So it's, it's about how the prodigal son came to his senses. And so ironically, when I was looking into this, the, the prodigal son, he 
He wanted what he wanted. You know, we all get into this time in our, in our life, and we just want what we want. We want control. My mom wanted control. But the, the thing is, his dad did not force him. He did not force him and make him say, no, you have to stay. I'm not giving you your money. You have to wait it out. He actually let him go. He just let him go to his foolish thoughts and realize that, you know, he, there's, he's going to have to suffer for, um, in some consequences down the road. So this is interesting because it's like a story. This is a story about God and us, right? We get into our nonsense. We get into our foolish. We want what we want. We, have, we want to do things. We look at God like he's not even there. We look at him like he's dead. And we call ourselves believers, and we have to come to the revelation that we have to come to our senses. Amen? So in the story, the father forgives him. God forgives us. Even though he went off and did his thing, he didn't force him. He knew something was going to happen, but he just let him be. So he waited, and when he came back, like God does with us, he opens him, opens up his arms to him and receives him and gives him the best. That's how good God is to us. If you can pull up Luke 15. I like using the, uh, the split screen, if you guys see that on Bible Gateway. It has two different meanings sometimes. So in Luke 15, a few days later, the younger son gathered up all he had left. He traveled far away. It was kind of the story we're talking about. If you can scroll down a little bit. Where it says, um, he, number 16, he was hungry that he wanted to eat the food of the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. The son realized that he had been very foolish. So you look at the different versions. One of them said he had to come to his senses. One said he was foolish. And in the 17, it says he had a moment of self-reflection. What am I doing here? And uh, when I was sharing this with my wife, I was kind of laughing because I was thinking we both have had talks like this. Even before we came to the church when we were in trouble, we would think sometimes you get into this point. And even, even before when we're single, you sometimes you're sitting there thinking like, I think I'm the problem. You know, I'm thinking... You can laugh at it now, but you're thinking like, what am I doing? I'm like, it's such an idiot. What am I doing? And you have to get to this realization. And, you know, in this version, in this story, that's what happens. You know, that's not something that he can get on his own. This is a gift from God. But, you know, the son wanted to control his own way. He wanted to do this on his own. So looking deep, deeper into this, I see a process here. The process is this. So you initially, if you want something so bad, God's going to be, and that happens here too, um, where you may want something so bad and you keep pushing for that green light and you were not going to get it, or a pastor might say, okay, God bless. And, um, you know, APC and I, we, um, us, we have a story of him and his God bless story. When he first came to the Osgood Church, um, he, was, he was here and he was doing good. And he just wanted to go to Vegas with his friends. And we're thinking like, oh, no, he can't go to Vegas. That's like Sin City, right? So he wanted to go to Vegas. And we said, well, let's talk to Pastor. So um, he asked Pastor and Pastor said, oh, yeah, God bless. So we're thinking, oh, no. So anyways, he goes. And I think he had like a horrible time. And he got into a fight with one of his buddies. But either way, uh, as you can see, God brought him back. <laughs> Amen. But see, this is the thing, even like the prodigal son's story or what happened to APC or what happened to us, is that when you go and do your own thing, right, there's always something that you don't expect. Something will come up. Um, Bishop Kim always says that God will create a circumstance that things will happen. So sometimes it could be, uh, you know, like with him, he, uh, there was a famine and he didn't, he didn't know and he lost everything. He ran out. So, or you might go to Vegas and realize that it was a bad idea. Or, you know, like even with us, we, um, my wife and I think about all the time, we do reflect back how things were and how good God is. We, there's a lot of things we did not. We made bad choices. And, you know, we had to think that through now. We had to think that we didn't even, we did not, 
think anything was going to happen, but it does. God will allow things to happen to get your attention. So it could be like somebody can get sick. You can, uh, there could be, uh, you know, someone can lose their job. You can have a problem with your spouse, your kids, something. There's always something, and God is actually trying to talk to us, trying to bring us back. And the good news is, like with the prodigal son, God, and even with my mom, God bails us out. Because my mom ended up giving her heart to the Lord at the end on that deathbed. And um, she died a short time later. And when we prayed over her, I didn't know if it was genuine or not. And we asked the pastors about it. And uh, we ended up finding out later that she did receive it. Uh, I told this story before where somebody had a dream here in the church. And they said that they seen me in the dream giving food, eating with this woman at a table. And they're like, hey, what's he doing with some other woman? And they're like asking her about it. I'm thinking like, I did nothing. It wasn't me. But um, anyhow, the dream interpretation of my pastor Eugene was that um, I was at the Lord's table feeding her the word. And she received it. So, and then she gave her heart to the Lord. So this is the problem. You know, a lot of times, and this happened with even with us. And even me, like growing up when we were back living back at uh, um, and back in Tracy and Mountain House, you know, sometimes you're not desperate enough. You think you kind of know everything. You're still kind of raw. You know, you're, you know, you get instruction, but you still, you still have like Pastor Kim, like Bishop Kim says, you have this residue in you that's still there, right? But the problem is that we're not desperate enough. And what happens is if you allow that. If you keep going in the wrong direction with the wrong control to control things yourself, the problem is you leave a gap. You leave a gap for the enemy. And um, it's kind of cool. I was listening to Bishop Kim's recent sermon, and he's talking about something random. But he somehow gets on the the area of um, about laziness, and he's talking about it. So he says that when you're lazy, you're going to actually create a gap. And then the spirit of laziness is going to come inside you, but it doesn't end there. They come in, they nest inside you. So we're in a, we have the privilege of being in a church where we're going to get higher revelation. We're going to get higher teaching like this. And it's our job whether or not we're going to follow it, right? But um, anyways, they come and nest in you. And it's not only that. They come in and they get all the other demons and they start inviting everybody else in. So now instead of that one, now you have anger. Now you have, um, he just lists a bunch of things, um, the different spirits that can come in and start coming inside you. And all of a sudden, now you're trying to like, you're in error, you're making mistakes, you're, you know, you're trying to control yourself. It just, it ends up being just a really bad scenario, kind of like what happened to the prodigal son. I was talking to Stephen recently about this story um, it was, I don't know if you guys heard, it was about that submarine, the, tit- the Titan. So it's like um, these guys made the submarine, and they wanted to commercialize it, so they took some billionaires and some people down into the ocean to go, they wanted to go see the Titanic, which was like 3,500, I guess, feet below the surface, pretty far down. Anyways, they're in there, and the guy, the owner, got so many warnings, so many warnings. The, the engineers, the people, the main driver of that, they were saying, like, oh, I don't know, there's something wrong. I don't feel this, and they end, up, they end up firing the guy. So they brought on engineers. They made some complaints. They fired him. So the guy just wanted to do what he wanted to do. He wanted to make this, and he wanted to make history. He said that, you know, it's our job, something about he wanted to explore and and. We should be able to know what's going on on the herb, whatever. Anyways, I wasn't interested in this story, but it just happened to come into my feed, and I was kind of interested. But anyways, long story short, um, when this, they were actually, they have to go on 3,500 feet. They were at only 400 feet away from their, their um area of being where the Titanic was on the bottom of the ocean. And I remembered right there, and I was thinking what Pastor always says, when you're on lap five, 500 laps, but it's 499, you crash. 
Well, unfortunately, this, uh, this sub, it imploded, which means, I kind of looked up what imploded means, but what it means is like, there was like a collapsing of, from pressure, right? And um, it fell apart. So when they went down there, they were like communicating, and at the end, they just lost communication. And they ended up finding out that um, even the engineers were saying that the back of this little sub could keep getting this little knocking noise. And what happens, they believe it was a leak from the wrong materials they used. And so because the guy didn't listen, um, they even said the word, there was a gap. There was a gap in the, in the back of the sub. And just even a pinch of water will go in there, and that thing will explode. Like They said it'll like split you in half. And anyways, it, it was so bad, all these people disintegrated. So it was, ends up being a big thing in the news, but so again, um, this, this one guy, this, the owner, he just wasn't listening to the red flags, all the warnings he was getting, and sometimes that happens to us, right? So we're supposed to, we get instructions, we get, we have to obey, we have to do certain things, but we don't listen. God will be like, okay, go ahead, God bless, and eventually there's things that are going to be coming up that we did not expect. And that's when an implosion can happen. It can actually can happen to people too, not physically, but spiritually, you can implode. You can start getting into the wrong things. You can, like I said, you can lose your job. Somebody can get hurt. Um, it's, it's our job to make the right decision, to come to our senses. Amen? So the moral of the story is we have to allow ourselves to be corrected. Can you pull up Second Timothy? Again, I put a split screen because there was some really good wording here. <clears throat> so the expanded Bible, if you read the expanded, it, has, it gives you like a little extra detail, a little extra wording in there and kind of puts better context. So the Lord's servant must gently teach, gently instructing, correcting those who disagree or opponents. So then maybe perhaps God will let them change their minds, grant them repentance so they can accept leading to knowledge of the truth and they can they may wake up to come to their senses so that's the key back here if you look back there it says that uh, they will change their mind and repent so that's that's our job we have to be able to not be the controlling one we have to we want to do the controlling one that is more of a sound mind and come to our senses and that's what this is saying, and they may wake up to come to their senses and escape from the trap, snare of the devil who catches them to do what he wants. One thing that always amazes me is that the more you get into the word, it becomes very exciting. Pastors have talked about this before, but like right here when he's talking about the trap, the snare, um, and you can Google it too, that, excuse me, in the Bible days, a trap, a snare, was something they would catch little animals, and that is considered like an offense. So escape from the trap, your offenses of the devil, who catches you to do what he wants. So this is implying that if you're offended, you're going to be doing what the devil wants. You're going to be making the wrong choices. You can actually be used by him to come against other, even believers. So we got to be careful. Can you uh, scroll back down? Yeah. He must correct those who are in opposition with courtesy and gentleness in the hope that God grant that they will repent and be led to the knowledge of the truth. Accurately, understanding, understanding, and the key right here is welcoming it. You have to be open. You have to be open to correction. You have to be open to new things, what God's trying to show you. It's going to go against the grain. You know, it's going to go against what maybe how you were taught or, or what you might be doing in the moment and that they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will so it's kind of scary you know we what what may come over natural to us is actually something that can be very dangerous and um you know we, we can end up in a really bad spot a couple other stories in the bible one of them was about uh, the woman at the well 
uh, Jesus spoke to her. And when he spoke to her, she was actually, she was deceived, right? She had all these men and people she was living with. So Jesus exposes her life. And at that moment, she actually came to her senses. And she ran back and told town and told everybody. Well, that's one story. The other one was Jonah and the whale. Um, he wanted to be in control. He wanted to do things his way. He didn't want to listen to God when God told him to go to Nineveh. So, of course, Jonah ends up getting swallowed by a whale, and he's in there. So once he comes to the point where he comes to his senses, he gets spit out. So thank God for Jonah getting spit out. A lot of times when we're here, even at each week, um, now we're doing the morning prayers. We're doing the night prayers. Um, so, you know, we see that our you know pastors are trying to um, get a lot of us more involved, and it's for our own good. And, you know, we have weekend services. We have, um, you know, of course, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, it's a really good thing. You know, it's a good thing, and it may be kind of uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be convenient, you know. That's something that we have to think about. Some of these instructions that will come over, it's going to be inconvenient, and it's going to cost us money or time. But we have to look at it like God is trying to create that circumstance to help us so we can get to be closer to him. Amen? So we have to look at how this is going to apply to us, people, our people in our church. And you can't come here thinking, mm, it's not for me because my life seems to be okay um, if you've been told or been instructed on anything here, no matter how small it is, um, we need to really look at the decisions that we're making. Is it the decision that we want to control or we want God to come to be in control and bring us to our senses? Because that's what happened to that sub. They said it was just a little pinhole. It was a little pinhole that the salt water got in, and that thing blew up that sub. So you cannot take it lightly. And I think that's the one of the reasons why I was led to that story because it made so much sense now. I was able to put the pieces together, you know. So it's always good to start taking inventory of our lives, right? Look at our finances. Um, how are we doing there? Are we losing money? Um, you know, do we need um, counseling for that? You know, we have God, we have our pastors, right? How's the peace at home, at war? Is there tension at home with spouse or kids, people in the house? You have to get very specific. And even for us, maybe like two, three years ago, we were just kind of reading and like we'd say like, yeah, okay, we would just read and take it for what it was. But we always believe that God, he wants us to dig. He wants us to dig and find the truth. I mean, you know, when you get the truth, you get set free, right? And... The, the more you dig, the more you're, you, there's going to be some things you may find out that are uncomfortable, that are kind of ugly or even hurtful or might have happened to you, but you have to dig. So even with all these, you know, God talk, talks to us through um, finances, our health, and our war. So with those, it's to our best interest to continue to dig. How's your health? Are we, are we exercising, eating well? Are we, are we old, overweight? Are we tired? You just have to ask yourself these questions. You know, you don't have to have somebody asking you that. You can do this. You know, this is for us to get closer to God because the more we are, we're going to glorify him with our lives, right? The Bible says we're known by our fruit. The question is, are we coming to our senses or are we just really putting on a show? You can pull up 1 Corinthians 15. Come to your senses, live justly, and stop sinning. And that's, that's a hint here for us. That when we not, have not come to our senses, we're actually in sin. And God does not want us to be in sin. But if we continue to push that and to go our own way, to have control over that, he's going to let you do it. He's going to let you do it until that thing comes up that you did not expect. And then eventually you're going to have to come back. It's true that some have the knowledge of God. I am saying this to shame you in better, into better habits. And the Living Bible version, get some sense and quit your sinning. For your shame, I say it, some of you are not even Christians and, at all. 
and have never really known God. That's kind of scary because, I mean, we, that's why we're here, right? We know God. God called us. And um, if we're sinning and we're doing this stuff or being in nonsense, right, the uh, Bible says that we may not really ever know God. So our job, again, is to which control, and I'm going to kind of go back over that real quick. Which control, what part of control are you living in? And one thing that we have found in our house, that even though you have two people, a spouse, or even like a spouse and kids, everybody could be in different areas of their life, right? So, like, for example, my wife can be doing well, doing her thing, and I could be over here in nonsense, or the other way around. So everybody has their own walk that God gives us, our own choice, our own free will, to make the right choices for him. Um, can you bring up Proverbs one twenty three? This one is the uh, the Bible dot com. I don't usually do that. Use this version, but this one was so good I had to use it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read that that whole section. It says one Proverbs one verse twenty three, but I'm gonna read twenty three on. You'll see it makes sense. Yeah, there you go. Come back to your senses and be restored to reality. Don't even think about refusing my rebuke. So this is about, so we're talking about making the right choice, doing that. But see, some of us may still think, "Mm, that's not for us. And they're going to continue this, right? They're going to be stubborn. They're going to keep wanting to be in the control. This is for those people that are stubborn and don't want to listen to come into your senses. Don't even think about refusing my rebuke. Don't you know that I'm ready to pour out my spirit of wisdom upon you and bring you the revelations of my words that will make your heart wise? I've called you over and over. Still, you refuse to come to me. I plead with you again and again, yet you turn a deaf ear to my voice. I think sometimes if we can stop a moment when we're doing our reading... Um, even for me, I don't, I don't blast through like 20 chapters. I, I have to like chew on these because some things you can miss if you're, you're fasting, right? You get that a lot. So in this case, um, some of these things really hit home with me. And we should listen to this. Because you have laughed at my counsel and have insisted on continuing in your stubbornness, I will laugh when your calamity comes, and I will turn away from your, you at the time of your disaster. So on one end, we have open arms, love. He opens the door for us. He gives us a party. He's, but we have to come to our senses. We have to repent. But still, sometimes we will be walking in this. Make a joke of my advice, will you? Then I'll make a joke out of you. When the storm clouds of terror gather over you, your head, when dread and distress consume you and your catastrophe comes like a hurricane, you will cry out to me, but I won't answer. Then it will be too late to expect my help. When desperation drives you to search for me, I will not be nowhere to, found, no, nowhere to be found. And uh, the area of desperation right there, it's kind of what I said earlier, is that we have to be into an area of desperation. doesn't mean your life's going to be in big trouble, but you have to realize that God called us. There's only about 130 plus people here or less. And if we look at how good God is and how we, we had no ability to do this, I, I surely did. And we talk about it, that uh, when you get to that point, you should be desperate for God. It's like he, he does everything for us. Even though we didn't deserve it, he'll go and show up for us. Um, there's another thing I put in here, too, where... Um, I remember Bishop Kim talking about it in a sermon, and he said that you have these windows of opportunity that come to you. There's like an, a, like an appointment, and that appointment will come, and it's your, you have that opportunity, opportunity, right, to jump in there and make that right decision, and God will bless you, and it will glorify him and so on. But sometimes we don't. We have stubbornness. We have whatever, and then you will miss that opportunity. So now that window will shut. It'll come down here, 
And you may get another opportunity, but guess what? It's always harder. It's happened to us. And, you know, just give an example. When we were living in Mountain House, um, I remember I was, um, at the time I was working at Porsche, and I did it my way. I wanted to do it. I just got a job, and I was making a little bit more money. It wasn't a lot. But um, I remember we had a, uh, we had impartation with, uh, I believe it was, a, was it pastors or Bishop Kim? And he said, okay, you've done things enough your way long enough. Now you're going to do things my way. And then that's when I got the job that I have now. And, he's, and pastors told me, I, it's my, I have to go lower. I have to go lower and stop trying to do things my way. So I, I had to, like, start all over. And, um, you know, I also had to go back to clean toilets and do my thing. But you know what? Uh, once I got that revelation, I had to come to my senses because I felt like if I didn't get that, I don't know what would have happened. Because you have turned up your nose at me and closed your eyes to the facts and refused to worship me in awe because you scoffed at my wise counsel. I laughed at my, and laughed at my correction. Now you will eat the bitter fruit of your own ways. You made your own bed, now lie in it. So how do you like that? You wouldn't think it would be said like that, right? You'd think like our loving God. Like an idiot. You've turned away from me and chosen destruction instead. Your self-satisfied smugness will kill you. But the one who always listens to me will live undisturbed in a heavenly heavenly peace, free from fear, confident, and courageous. That one will rest unafraid and sheltered from the storms of life. That's just a, that's really a sobering it's a warning to us, but at the same time, it's still even at the end. He said that he will he will shelter us. So we still get a choice, right? This whole thing is about we gotta we have to take the inventory. Even in our current job now, we're constantly taking inventory of like what we're doing, how we're doing it, the equipment we have. We have to do it every quarter, right? So this way, it just keeps you up on everything. But once you, when you do that, you take, your, you take the inventory. Now you have a clear area. You're not too far back. So, so if, say if something's wrong or you're missing something, uh, maybe you're doing something wrong and it's not the best way to do it, you can fix it. And you don't have to go like months and doing it the wrong way. You can actually fix it more quickly. So God gives us the ability to look into this, make a better choice, and come to our senses. But the bottom line is it's up to us. Amen?